I'm Paul Butler, the President and Chief Transformation Officer at New America. I'm excited to welcome you to today's event. It's being hosted by the Future of Land and Housing Program and Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership between Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. Future Tense uh, examines emerging technologies, public policy, and society through content that's published on slate.com and through events like this one. We're here today to discuss climate change, not solely as a challenge, but also as an opportunity to drastically reimagine life in the United States, on the coast and beyond. Right now, the US is at a climate crossroads. Rising sea levels, along with more frequent and intense storms, threaten over 100 million Americans who currently live on the coasts. One in six people, largely out west, now live in areas with significant wildfire risk. And in places like Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the country, extreme temperatures make places nearly unlivable in the summer. There's no denying that climate impacts are increasingly and dramatically affecting where Americans live. They're also affecting our relationships to our homes, our businesses and communities. And these can often feel like overwhelming challenges, but we're not powerless in determining our climate future. From our work here at New America and from the work of our partners, it's clear that communities can adopt locally based, equitable and just solutions that help them manage and even thrive in the face of climate change. In some cases, existing tools and policies can be adopted to the local context and elsewhere. We need to chart new paths for what our climate future looks like. And so it's our hope that policymakers, innovators, advocates, and organizations and communities themselves can come together to find creative solutions in the coming decades. So I'm thrilled to kick off today's conversation. An amazing panel will focus on the mix of innovative public policies and societal reimagining that's needed to ensure that the US coasts and other communities impacted by climate change, that they prosper well into the future. So first, thanks again for joining us. And now I'm gonna pass the floor to Yulia Panfil, who's the director of New America's Future of Land and Housing Program. She'll be moderating today's discussion. Yulia, I'll pass it to you. Thanks so much, Paul, and welcome everyone. Thank you uh, to Slate Future Tens for co-hosting this fantastic event with us. So I'm really excited to moderate this amazing panel. I will briefly introduce the panelists, then we will jump into about 45 minutes of discussion, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for audience Q&A. Our first panelist is Abram Lustgarden who is a New America Fellow and a senior reporter for ProPublica, where he covers climate change and the environment. Abram is also the author of a forthcoming book on climate migration. We're also joined by Brenda Cooper, who is a technologist, writer, and a futurist. She's the author of a fantastic fiction story, Out of Ash, that uh, came out in Slate Future Tense just a few months ago that we'll be discussing. Next, we have Tim Robustelli, who is a policy analyst for New America's Future of Land and Housing Program and who leads our work on climate change. And finally, Elaine Morales, Director of pa Partnerships and Policy for Connective, which is a hub for disaster preparedness and recovery in the Texas Gulf Coast region. Welcome everyone. And Abram, let's start with you. Last year, you authored a New York Times Magazine piece titled Climate Change Will Force a Great American Migration that paints a pretty dire picture of the impacts of climate change on coastal communities. Can you frame up the climate threat that America's coastal communities are facing right now? Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'm really happy to be here and a part of this conversation today. Um, 
I, I grabbed some statistics from the book research that I've been working on uh, that helps frame that question. Is basically, the sea level rises, sea levels have maintained a, a pretty static level for the 2000 years before the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of, of large scale human emissions into the atmosphere. Um, since then, they've riven, risen about nine inches. Um, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's enough to be noticeable. And uh, it, the U.S. coastlines are the places where that sea level is rising fastest. So um, uh, there's about 133 million Americans, or about 42% of our nation's population, that live on uh, coastlines in the United States and uh, from pl in places like Brownsville, Texas, or uh, Charleston, or Norfolk, or Long Island, um, sea level rises have risen nine inches just since 1960 alone. So they're outpacing uh, the pace of global sea level rise. And what that means, of course, is, um, you know, people who are directly affected by, uh, by those rising waters will have to move or adapt to that situation. It's uh, sea level rise is a little different from, say, wildfires or extreme heat, where we can all kind of decide what our personal threshold is for uh, for withstanding it, I mean, when you're when you're flooded, when your home is underwater, you have to you have to leave. It's it's a little bit more of a of a black and white uh, kind of scenario. And that nine inches of sea level rise already is leading to really significant changes in how Americans uh, live. So Norfolk, Virginia, for example, that used to see sunny day flooding or high uh, high tide. Uh, flooding about, um, you know, once or twice a year is already uh, uh, seeing it about 14 times a year. Um, and I see the same here in the Bay Area where I live outside of San Francisco. We have sunny day flooding uh, uh, coming up through sewage systems and into the streets, um, directly affecting, uh, you know, our, our quality of life here. So the question is, how bad will it get and how fast will it uh, get bad. And um, that depends on the rate of emissions uh, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, puts uh, sea level rise estimates at between four and nine feet uh, by the end of the century. Um, that's a huge range, but four feet is, is bad enough. Nine feet would be absolutely catastrophic. And um, I presume we'll come back to it, but that probably suggests a very significant migration of people, of those hundred and uh, 33 million people who live on coastlines or near coastlines um, away from those coastal areas. Thanks, Abram. And that statistic is just mind boggling. 42% of the US population living on or along coastlines, such a significant part of our population that's immediately impacted by this threat. Uh, Tim, turning to you, what have coastal communities been trying so far to meet this threat and how successful have those efforts been? Sure, thanks, Yulia. Just want to say uh, thanks to Paul and our partner Future Tense before jumping in and, and just excited to be here with uh, my awesome co-panelists today. Um, so there's a lot of action and energy at the local level when it comes to climate adaptation. You know, we see it in cities and towns across the U.S. actively trying a real mix of public policies, whether that's buyback programs, such as the Blue Acre program in New Jersey, sort of the government paying homeowners to move away from flood prone areas on the Jersey coast and a bit inland. Uh, there's talk and plans of, of seawalls and, you know, extending uh, coastlines and even natural climate solutions, such as uh, rebuilding mangrove forests uh, in places such as Miami and New York, uh, lower Manhattan, even Boston. Um, then we have some managed retreat policies that's being implemented um, you know, in places such as uh, the coast of Alaska, um, on the Gulf Shore in Louisiana in particular. And I'd say that there's, you know, there's been a range of, of successes and challenges when it comes to these, these local solutions. Um, obviously, there's, there's a need for funding. Uh, this is a large problem, which requires, you know, to be frank, expensive solutions. Um, and, you know, there's also sort of a challenge of political will in many places. You know, there's uh, <clears throat> folks disagree about what should be done, if anything should be done sometimes, um, and, and sort of the associated community buy-in as well. You have folks with a lot of different interests, some folks right on the shore, some folks a bit more inland, um, but all part of the same community sort of figuring out uh, what to do. So all that to say, um, there's a lot going on um, and a lot that different communities can, can learn from each other as well. Thanks, Tim. Elaine, turning to you, you're based in Houston, which of course 
was battered by Hurricane Harvey in 2017 uh, and has since seen other storms and increasingly severe weather events. How are the Houston area and broader Gulf Coast communities you work with thinking about climate adaptation? What are some of the questions that you hear policy makers and communities asking and what are some of those choices that they're grappling with? Thank you, Julian. I'm very glad to be here and part of this conversation. Um, yeah, Houston communities are thinking about the climate often. Um, we are reminded about the urgency of reducing our vulnerabilities and adapting constantly. Um, over the last decade, we've seen years of drought and then all of a sudden five years of flood events and, you know, more than, you know, seven federally declared, declared disasters since 2015. Um, worst case scenarios are saying that our neighbor Galveston is going to be underwater um, in 2060, um, that temperatures will be getting hotter, but all of a sudden we freezed last year through the winter storm. Um, so climate change is bringing a lot of uncertainty to our communities and when we are already feeling underwater by the needs and challenges of the present, discussing, discussing our future uh, can be very unsettling. Um, so in preparation for this panel, I wanted to call friends and um, other partners to see, including policymaker, academics, and people working on the ground. And what I heard on the common thread is, we know the problem, we know what we, we can do about it, um, but we need radical transformation in the way we do things. And there are a lot of questions that remain. Um, you know, some are, what is it going to take to change this rhetoric that climate adaptation is too expensive? Um, while we are seeing and the government and others pushing contradicting practices. Um, we are still building in the floodplain. Um, you know, how come Northeast Houston, a BIPOC neighborhood, sitting in a shallow floodplain isn't getting significant investments to retrofit or elevate structures or to reimagine its drainage infrastructure when we are seeing our state, our state spending billions to expand uh, I-45 highway in Houston at the expense of forced displacement and more pollution um, when we know half of our local emissions come from transportation, um, which can feel like a waste of money in the face of climate change. Um, how might we, Houston, the self-described energy capital of the world, conceive of a new climate forward identity in which we can push for a clean transition and build resilient carbon-free infrastructure that doesn't leave us to freeze or to die in the heat? Um, are we going to you know, enforce strict regulations on emissions, invest in fortification and weatherization strategies? How can we envision climate adaptation strategies that are centered in equity and community? Um, and what that looks like for Houstonians with disabilities or low-income communities of color. Um, but overall, we want to have hope and hopefully build a better future. Um, you know, I think that you know, it's a, a privileged concept right now for many communities in Houston to think about leaving or even having the choice to move. Um, considering also that this is a global issue, that we all are going to experience climate change in one way or another. Um, so we know that there are many solutions out there. We discuss, you know, oyster reef in our coast that can capture zero, you know, carbon capture and also protect our coast. Um, we can mitigate the effects with um, zero carbon buildings, um, but both things can improve our quality of life and improve the environment. Um, but we actually need to do it. Um, we know that we can move people that are at high risk to higher ground in our community. We know we need to change our relationship with water. Uh, what does it look to be flood proofed um, and making space in a safe way for water? Um, so we just think that this is the moment we can all go in and we can kind of divide climate adaptation versus the needs of the present. Um, so everything that we do has to be part of it. And I know that's easier said than, than done. Thanks so much, Elaine, uh, for really laying out the issues. And I want to come back to this uh, idea of radical transformation that you had mentioned. But before going there, I want to um, uh, come over to Brenda. Uh, as we heard from Elaine, of course, one of the choices in this choice set is to 
go to leave. And you just wrote a really fantastic future tense fiction story uh, about the mayor of Olympia, Washington, who chooses to relocate the city uh, away from sea level rise. And she struggles to get anyone to move there despite the obvious risks of staying. Why is that such an important story to tell? Let me make a couple of points. First, I think science fiction is a great way to explore the future and get a feeling about the things that are happening. It's, you know, we can research the science, we can learn the same things that everyone else on this panel is learning, and we can put it in a more emotional, personal context. So that's why we write stories about climate, and many, many writers are writing stories, poetry, a lot of things about climate in order to help us begin to wrestle with the emotional impact of doing this kind of thing. Um, in this case, I chose a city that probably will have to move. And I think it's important to understand um, that this isn't something we can run away from. Um, we can't just assume that sea level rise isn't going to happen or that we can push it back or that we can mitigate as was mentioned earlier. Like I can protect my house from fire by cutting down all the trees around it so the firefighters can save it. Bad idea, but I can do that. Um, but I really, there's nothing you can do about the ocean. It's, it's an inexorable force and it's gonna impact our climate in significant ways and our coastlines. And we're gonna have to figure out how to move both money and power, which are very difficult things to move because that's what's concentrated along the coastlines, frankly. And while we're doing that, we also need to figure out how to create better places so that the places we're abandoning become actually better places for us to move to. And then how do you convince people um, that they can create a new community? You're, very, you're unlikely to be able to pick up all of the people that exist in, in a certain area, unless you're in a tribe or a very small group and say, I'm just gonna move these people from here to here. People are actually gonna flow to many different places, but you're still gonna need brand new cities and brand new places where people can congregate and live in a way that is maybe a little bit easier, a little bit more intentional to get out some of Elaine's comments as far as how we can create social structures that will um, thrive along with an earth that we can help thrive. So, you know, I think it's important to look at the significant political and economic difficulties in making these moves. Absolutely. And I want to, so I'd, I'd like to come back to uh, this term, Elaine, that you used of radical transformation, right? That this is not a challenge that can be met with incrementalism. And we have to think big because the challenge is so large. So I'm curious to hear from everyone on the panel, how do we get there? How do we get people to think in that frame and move past some of the political and economic constraints that we all know exist. I, I could take a stab, I guess. I, I, uh, the long pause is because there's no easy answer. So I don't think I have, <laughs> I have one either. Um, uh, and to be honest, I'm cynical about, you know, our, our potential to get there. Um, but I, but I, just a few thoughts I mean, on this idea of the sort of scale and scope of change that's needed. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I'm talking to right now are uh, pointing out that the very idea of resilience, um, it sort of implies this elasticity to return to where we are now, you know, to a sort of status, status quo, and that that's not uh, sufficient. Uh, you know, this sort of um, that uh, that faster, more disruptive change will be needed because we're going to have faster and more disruptive change imposed on us. So, um, you know, the the urgency is that we figure out how to, uh, you know, have sort of a radical change, uh, or it will just be imposed on us um, before we figure it out, and you know, and one or one or the other will happen. Um, but I think a lot of it, uh, you know, a lot of the potential solutions and a lot of, you know, what has to happen um, starts with an economic realization of uh, what's at stake. Uh, you know, I think the costs for the country, the cost for coastal communities, the cost for taxpayers will soon be uh, apparently huge. We, we know that they're projected to be huge, but I think we'll start to realize that and live that experience soon. Um, 
And so with that comes, again, both more pressure, but also some opportunity, uh, because as soon as you have, you know, kind of those relative costs, there's a greater potential to make, um, you know, relatively large investments in response to it or in com or compared to it. And, you know, and that's part of what needs to happen. And, uh, you know, and I agree, uh, you know, with Elaine that um, a, a huge component of, of what probably has to happen is a social reorganization of our, of our values, a sort of, a, you know, a looking at the way that sort of the capitalistic mechanisms, um, you know, incentivize or don't incentivize the right kind of action and change. And, you know, adapting coastal communities, for example, to sea level rise, we're looking at where those people move or supporting their movement uh, really comes down to, you know, fundamental policies that, include things like section eight housing and where do you build enough schools, uh, you know, and, uh, and also climate infrastructure like seawalls and things like that. So it's a huge range and, um, and the challenge is going to be, uh, you know, as you said, Yulia, like getting political support for that uh, change and, uh, you know, and then finding the money for it. The money will be easier to justify once the actual costs, uh, you know, are more apparent, unfortunately. Um, that might take a little bit more time. Yeah. I want to jump in and, and first I agree with you that I think we're going to see, you know, we can either let this happen to us or we can have a voice in what happens. I expect both are going to happen. You know, there things will happen that we don't react to the way that we should, but we will begin. And I think already are in many cases beginning to think about how do we mitigate or how do we adapt or how do we change? Um, I'm probably the most corporate person here. I work for a construction company <laughs> rather than, than being in a more academic world. And we are focused on purpose. We're focused on building green. We're focused on, on DEI activities and seriously focused. It's not um, just greenwashing. It's not just we want to want, want to talk about diversity. We're actually working really hard to bring a number of these changes in. And I think we have to address these kinds of problems, we have to address, address the inequality in income and the inequality in power. We have to address making uh, it possible for everyone to, to succeed if they want to. And we're not alone. A lot of the corporations that we know or work with or are familiar with in the Washington state area, of course, we're a very blue state, but we're very focused on making these changes. And our leadership and our governor is focused on making these changes as well. And I think that all of these efforts together can add up to at least part of the solution. I'll just jump in with, with one quick comment. Um, radical transformation can, can seem daunting and sort of reorganizing society socially, politically, economically can, can seem like a challenge that's overwhelming, but I like to look sort of from an international context sometimes and, and see what's been done elsewhere. And there are examples that Rotterdam and, and the Netherlands um, and sort of how they deal and live with water and sort of how they think socially about it um, that can remind us that like, this is, this is a large challenge, but it's not impossible. This radical transformation isn't impossible. And, and we have examples to perhaps emulate um, and adapt to local contexts here. Um, to show, you know, that it can be done, um, but it, you know, it'll take the, it'll take the social will, it'll take the political will, but it's possible. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to say that, you know, when thinking about radical transformation, it, it really, you know, I, I think of how we let go of the things we are used to and the things that we uh, assume are truths or things that cannot change. Um, you know, many of our current systems are extractive and oppressive for many communities. And we, we can think about systems that build capacity and are responsive to people rather than economies, for example. Um, we, we can think about, you know, our communities are telling us that they are resilient, that they have survived, that they continue to, um, but the systems they're operating under are not supporting their flexibility uh, to be resilient. Um, and, and, you know, when you look, we have systems that continue to put the burden back to disproportionately affected communities as if, you know, individual awareness was going to protect them from the floods. Or, um, you know, we have social service systems that weed people out from assistance. Um, you know, we know that disaster recovery widens inequities and wealth gaps between white populations and black populations. We know that 
we have systems of weak regulations that allow people to be living next to industry at their, their expense of health and, you know, nature and their life. Um, we have an immigration system that pretends that we don't live and share the same planet and prevents people from looking for safety and security when they're, you know, from them, them to find it. So I think that to start perpetuating these inequities, um, we should be thinking about how do we build economic mobility for everyone, um, you know, even providing reparations to address these historic inequities. Um, so we can move from these list of options that we have to address climate change and transform them into choices for everyone. So people can choose how to, you know, if they want to stay, if they want to go, um, how they can have equal participation in these decisions. Um, so I think the barriers to adapt to our climate reality uh, are not lack of facts, of information, of technology. Um, it's the lack of focus and uh, a sustained political will to do what has to be done. Elaine, I'm glad that you uh, went in this direction and started speaking directly about the equity implications of this conversation. I'd love to hear from the other panelists as well. Uh, you know, how do we ensure that climate adaptation is done in a way that's solving inequities and not simply perpetuating them or exacerbating them. Um, how, how are we thinking about this question? I can jump in to start. Um, I think it has to come from the bottom up. There has to be a, a very strong emphasis on community engagement and sort of elevating the voices of folks on the ground to make sure that their concerns, their interests, their needs are being properly accounted for. Uh, we sort of talk about the need for political will and, and perhaps technical guidance and funding can come from Washington or state capitals. But when it comes to planning out what the next move is, I, I think that, you know, listening to folks on, on the shores um, in, in places that are flood prone um, is critical. I think one of the keys is going to be shifting money down. Um, and I think that's going to take changing our tax structure, changing some of the other things that we're doing. And frankly, many of the people who have a lot of money are saying, tax me more. We're seeing that movement in many places. And I think that we should be doing that. And I think there's some conversation about how do we make that happen? Because, um, I mean, trickle down has never worked. It's always been a theory. And we've got to find ways to take this money and put it back into social services, put it back into infrastructure. Um, the, the people along the coast in Washington state, while well, some of them are very rich, some of them are also very poor. We don't, we have a lot of beaches that are not destinations. Um, they're cold. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and those people are going to need help. They're not going to be able to pick themselves up and move. And so we're going to have to find ways to provide structures and resources to allow them to make their own decisions about what do they want to do rather than just going in and taking over their land and saying, you know, go help yourselves. We have, you know, we have to create really good structures and we're going to have to move money around to do that. I would add that it, uh, I think it, it starts with recognizing how unequal uh, environmental and climate conditions, you know, have been in the past, uh, you know, and I think we're all probably a little bit familiar with, you know, environmental justice movements and exposures to, you know, to pollution harms, but, um, but, you know, the, the exposure to climate change is also unbelievably uh, unequal, uh, whether that's, you know, um, you know, the difference in tree cover in urban areas for, you know, for black and brown neighborhoods as opposed to white neighborhoods, uh, or the temperature that results from that, it's literally hotter, uh, you know, in, uh, in communities with people of, of color, uh, or the difference in housing stock, uh, the vulnerability that comes with living in, you know, in trailer parks in hot climates across the Southwest, uh, you know, and on the East Coast, especially, you know, as Brenda was pointing out, in a lot of coastal areas, uh, are poor and they started poor before the rush, you know, for second homes and, um, and sort of wealthier fantasy living. And so, you know, going way back to, you know, to the Revolutionary War, you had, um, or, you know, to after, um, 
at uh, the end of slavery, you had uh, you know black communities seeking agricultural lands on the coastline of Maryland, for example, um, where uh, no one else wanted that land, and those land no one wanted it because they were low lying and you know and flood frequently, and now they flood more frequently, and those are the communities um, that are most at risk. So recognizing how unbalanced and how urgent that need is, I think, is a starting point, and then. Um, you know, I'll take my thoughts really big picture because I think about this globally and I think about the stability, uh, you know, of of uh, countries in conflict, um, you know, and not to be too sort of hyperbolic about it, but um, not paying attention to these divisions, which will be exacerbated by change will ultimately lead to, you know, to instability. And so um, you see that sort of in, you know, in the political, uh, you know, divisions in the United States already, but imagine, uh, you know, if these inequities go unattended to for another couple of decades, uh, what kind of pressures that puts on American society. So I think that there's a real, you know, incentive, uh, for everyone, um, you know, to, to sort of roll up their sleeves and, and dig into, this isn't really just sort of a philanthropic or, you know, be good to all people kind of issue where we all have, um, something to benefit from, um, you know, from equalizing the effects and addressing our solutions uh, across the board. Um, I just want to add that when, when thinking about equity and recently we've seen this thing about going to space or bunker down someplace, um, it's, it's always in relation to who is able to go to space or bunker down in, in the middle of, of the country. And I, and I think it's because we are operating, you know, under this scarcity mentality or, you know, selfishness mentality of protecting my assets, protecting my life uh, at the expense of others. Um, so I think like if we can, you know, remove that type of mentality and instead go from an equity mentality, um, you know, it won't be, oh, it's too expensive, it's not feasible, uh, we don't have enough resources um, for it. I saw a quote this week that said, there's enough if we share. I think that in the context of climate change, there's enough if we care about it. So um, just put it that out there. So how do we, how do we do that? How do we get people who are not yet bearing the brunt of climate impacts and for whom this is still in a sense a hypothetical or a kind of academic issue to care enough about this topic to you know put money into it and put political action into it and prioritize it Two comments. One, I think most people either are affected or are beginning to feel affected. I think the day when there were people who were not affected is behind us. I don't think there's any part of the United States, for example, that is not somewhat affected, at least by climate, if not more so, and or knows people. So, so I think we're past. Uh, secondly, I think we have to get better messaging out. There's still this sort of mixed political messaging. There's lies frank lies on, on many sides of it. And somehow we have to address that. And I don't know how we address that, but I think it's very important that we can address speaking truth and helping people understand that there isn't a single truth about climate. That, you know, there are many sciences studying it. That's gonna, what we learn is gonna change over and over. And many times when I talk to people who are confused or don't know what to do or are trying to ignore it, They'll point to the fact that we've had many, many mixed and different messages, which is true because we've been learning more and more. I've been studying this for 10 years and the uh, predictions have gotten worse and worse quite regularly. And so I think we need to teach people more about this being a science, more about the details of it. And we need to figure out how to make it, make there be consequences for flat out lies about climate. And I don't know how to do that. That's a really hard one, but I think it's important. I can throw in two two thoughts as well. Um, uh, minor one, maybe it's a pipe dream, but I think leadership, you know, is is just critical on this. This does not have to be a, a an entirely democratic process where every single citizen agrees to make this investment. This is, you know, an opportunity for people who understand better and in a position of power to um, to do what they think is necessary. Uh, and the second is that. Um, 
action doesn't need to be framed as uh, as climate action. And you're seeing plenty of examples where it's not. Um, it's just necessary action. Sometimes it's just doing the same old things that we've known for decades need to be done to shore up communities. Uh, you know, if you can see Ron DeSantis in Florida taking action to protect flooding communities and, you know, essentially addressing climate change while disavowing climate change, um, it sort of doesn't matter what the climate change language is as long as uh, you know we begin to you know to raise money and make investments some of these projects are going to take a long long time um, to build and um, you know and equity ultimately also you know stems from just starting starting somewhere um, so you can you can frame these as economic projects or uh, you know business improvement projects or infrastructure or whatever you want to call it besides climate change One comment just to, to add to Abram and, and Brenda's who I completely agree with. I, I think, you know, policy creating incentives and disincentives um, for folks and the decisions that they make can play a part in this as well. Uh, whether it's flood insurance or subsidies provided after a disaster to rebuild, you know, a house that's been destroyed by a hurricane three times. Uh, do we want to rethink some of those policies and sort of how we shape the choices um, that, that folks are making through through incentives or, or disincentives financially or otherwise, I think can play a big part in it as well moving forward. Actually, Tim, I've often wondered if the insurance companies aren't actually going to be the ones that help lead us out of this. Yeah, there's saying, certainly some. Oh, oh, no, go ahead, Tim. I said there's certainly something to say about that, um, you know, sort of banks and others that are underwriting 30 year mortgages and how they're thinking about you know, the risk that's associated um, with houses on the coasts or, or houses in flood prone areas. So there is a bit of movement on that. And, um, you know, money talks, right? So I, I think uh, sometimes uh, they can be the first movers on that um, to change where people are building and rebuilding. I'm seeing some head nodding all around. So let me stay on this for a little bit and see if anybody else wants to jump in on this topic of, you know, how do you align incentives uh, towards tackling climate change? Yeah, I was nodding my head a lot. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I can get about as, as wonky as, as anybody wants on insurance. I've looked at it, you know, a lot. And, you know, um, Tim is exactly right. Uh, it cuts both ways, though. So, you know, for by brief way of background, I'd say insurance policy and uh, and the insurance market is one of the big reasons why coastal communities are in the, you know, in the trouble that they're in. Um, the number of people that have moved and been encouraged by cheap subsidized insurance to move to coastlines, you know, over the last couple of decades is enormous. And I've got this stat here that, um, you know, the result of that, I think there's uh, twice as many people live in coastal counties now as they did in the 1960s. And uh, the value of property now at stake is $36 trillion, which is 30% higher than it was just in 2012. So the stakes are big. And a lot of that is because insurers offered policies and because states mandated that where insurers didn't want to, that they offer it anyway, and that they offer it cheap. Uh, you know, Florida, for example, Louisiana, Texas, they've all, um, uh, you know, set low prices for insurance and required uh, insurers to offer homeowners policies at that price. Um, so then the flip side of that, you know, is that insurers are beginning to realize it's not in their best interest to remain and they'll start to pull out. And that can be a positive incentive for what we're talking about. It can also be a real risk for, uh, you know, those same, um, you know, lower income communities uh, who won't have anywhere to go uh, if they can't insure their homes or will lose a lot of the equity that they've managed to accumulate if they can't insure their homes. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, in general, I think it's great for signals to start um, pushing people to at least recognize blunt what the true risk is of the environments that they live in. Uh, that's an adjustment, but it, I think it'll be a painful uh, um, adjustment. And uh, just to uh, point on that in terms of incentives and also thinking about the work that we normally do every day as part of, you know, fighting back climate change, you know, in Houston and in the country, we have a housing, you know, affordable housing crisis. And there are these tensions between builders and, you know, uh, developers to say we can't build resilient homes or resilient strategies because it is increasing the cost. So you're asking me to, you know, reduce the cost to have more affordable housing, but then you're telling me that this needs to be resilient. And I think like there's a return on investment for resilient homes that, you know, can be 
you know, it should be sold either to the government or private sector as, as incentive of why to do these things. We know that, you know, $1 investments in mitigation um, are, you know, $11 expenses during recovery when, when these homes are affected. So I think that retrofitting, rehabbing the naturally afforded, affordable occurring housing that we have, but also build to do that is part of how we fight climate change as well. So I'll just ask a couple more questions and then we can move to the audience Q&A. Uh, for those in the audience, please feel free to drop your questions in um, using, the, um, using the question function and we'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, Elaine, I wanted to come back to Something that you said during our planning call that really struck me, um, you said that it's not that communities aren't resilient to climate change, it's that the systems that they live under aren't resilient. What did you mean by that? Um, I tackled that uh, before, but it's about how, you know, the current systems we live under, the disaster recovery systems are widening, you know, wealth gaps that you know migration systems are not thinking about the needs of people and um, it's this lack of prioritization of humanity um, over economy and how do we think about climate change solutions as not being oppressive and destructive but rather building you know support to for these communities to thrive in the face of climate change they know they have survived you know redlining policies and, you know, uh, lack of regulations and um, feeling, you know, that the communities have to take care of each other and they have, they have, um, they have these so strong social networks, but we need to ensure that public sector support is there to balance um, that bottom up build capacity. How do we help governments and private sector to learn from the resilience of communities um, to be more flexible and responsive to what's going on. So I'll end with uh, this quote, uh, and I'd like for each of the panelists to just briefly respond to it from a New America fellow, Lee Drotman, and he wrote that while it's easy and valuable to imagine worst case scenarios in order to avoid them, it's also important to imagine best case scenarios in order to try to bring them about. We can't enter an era of transformation without a realistic utopian vision for it. So what has been an example that you can point to of a transformative best case scenario uh, on this topic that gives you some hope for the future? fiction writer. So I'm going to go to a fiction example that I think is fabulous. And I believe New America actually talked about this in another panel. But Kim Stanley Robinson's work on this topic is phenomenal. And his book, Ministry of the Future, which I think came out last year, addresses a lot of the systemic and monetary issues that we're going to have to address, and the political issues, and the idea that we have to look at things as, uh, as a globe and not as a bunch of individual small areas. And so for me, that book had in it a lot of hope and a lot of possible solutions and just the idea that, yes, we can do this, we can get through this. And I think one of the things we're missing is that hope. Fiction might be a good place to answer <laughs> this question. I mean, I think, um, well, first of all, I'm going to stick up for the importance of, of talking about worst case scenarios, um, because uh, uh, it doesn't have to be the only part of the conversation, but it's really important, first of all, that we're honest about how, how difficult things are going to be. Um, and, uh, and secondly, we seem to keep outpacing what we think the worst case scenarios are. So um, they may not be the worst case scenario, but it, but it is important to pair that with a recognition of what the opportunity is. And that opportunity can come in lots of different ways. And there is that huge, big picture, global, you know, partnership kind of sense of opportunity that, you know, that Kim Stanley Robinson writes about. Um, 
in my research on on Americans migration now, you know, opportunity to different people looks like, uh, you know, potentially moving into places that are less vulnerable and, um, you know, and uh, there's change that comes with that, uh, you know, so there's a lot of data that I've been looking at, for example, looking at uh, crop yields across the country and how they change with temperature and the economic um, impacts of that. And obviously for the southern part of the United States, that's bad. Uh, but for the northern part of the United States, that's potentially good. And, and that's the kind of thing where, um, you know, a small seed of economic opportunity can lead to a, to a bigger seed. As if you imagine in the northern part of the United States, crop yields increase, farming increases, uh, the farm industry that's something like a, you know, a $34 billion annual industry in, you know, in Oklahoma and Kansas, uh, part of the Midwest shifts into, you know, um, you know, Wisconsin and Minnesota uh, and North Dakota, that that's, you know, that there is enormous economic opportunity for that place or for the repopulation of cities like Detroit and so forth. So that's one place I think people see opportunities. Um, but also just in general, uh, when things get urgent, um, and again, you know, it comes with pain, but when we do start to make those huge investments in cities or in seawalls or in new technology and so forth, um, every time that happens, it's an opportunity to rebuild things um, the way we imagine them to be for the future. Uh, and, you know, for some people in some places, that's going to be chock full of opportunity. Yeah. Um, going to, I agree with the worst first kind of approach, um, and I I see hope um, for future in the glimpses of success um, that we are seeing in our community. Um, you know, in Houston, we, we've seen that collective networks are built bottom up through crisis and pressure tests. Like after Harvey, we saw new organizations that have come online to elevate the voices of those in the front lines and they are working towards environmental justice, equitable mobility, food access, affordable housing, just disaster recovery. And I think that highlighting and elevating these efforts um, will hopefully allow us to prioritize action over perfection and start kind of like wars first and see big investments in crisis areas and move past the planning stage into action. Uh, we have so many plans, you know, resilient Houston plan, climate action plans, neighborhood-based plans. So how do we move now into action without the fear of, of, of making mistakes? Like we can readjust. And um, thinking about kind of like more in the fictional or utopian vision, um, I think like we hope for a future in which we have adapted, um, in which we are ready for these shocks. And when um, we always say at Connective that we hope that when disaster strikes, there's no emergency. Um, and I really hope that frontline communities are not left behind to fend for themselves, um, but that instead we have joined forces through participatory practices um, and transform these systems into humanity first systems like that, you know, where care is the norm, where empathy and dignity are priority. Um, and I, you know, we in the ground in the frontline communities where, you know, we are experiencing these worst uh, case scenarios, um, I think we need to believe in that vision because our survival depends on it. I'll round us out and uh, just build off what Elaine said about the, the glimpses of success and sort of looking at what's been accomplished at the local level, whether it's uh, an innovative solution such as a basketball court that doubles as a retention pond uh, when, you know, the floods come or is it a dike that serves as uh, a park for an underserved community uh, during sunny days. So just seeing that there is action and that there are folks that are being innovative and creative to, to confront this problem, both at the local level and perhaps more sort of <clears throat> broadly uh, to reimagine what we're doing. So that gives me hope um, how creative folks can be to, to try and address this problem. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes of audience Q&A and I'm gonna move us right from the utopian to the realistic. I'm reading this first question and it's cracking me up because it's basically just the name of our panel thrown back at us as a question. And the question is, what is Coastal America's future? So <laughs> Brenda, uh, if you don't mind, maybe since you're the futurist, I'm gonna put you on the spot to maybe start us off. What do you think is actually gonna happen if you had a crystal ball? 
Okay. Uh, well, futurists don't have crystal balls, first of all. We're, we're not necessarily really great at, at predicting, but we do understand, I think, a lot of the trends that are happening. So if I were to just take the future of my state as a way to sort of take a look at that, because we are on the coast. Um, my guess is that Seattle may thrive. We have, there's money in Seattle, there's engineering know-how in Seattle, there's political will in Seattle. We already have a seawall, we can build it bigger. We'll have to, we'll see some changes, we'll see some things that are bad that will happen. But by and large, I would imagine Seattle will stay on the coast and we'll be able to figure out how to do well. I think Olympia is going to have to move. And I think some of our other coasts, we have we have entire cities built on peninsulas that are at like three feet above seawater. And they're not going to survive this. You know, I mean, whether it's 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, the water is just going to be up over those places. And they don't even have a way to build up because you'd be building up on sand. You know, so we're going to see a lot of our communities back up off of the coast. And I think some of this is going to be really difficult and hard. It's not like you just get to create a brand new pretty beach right where the sea level rise took away your old beach. We're gonna see a different kind of coastline and we're gonna see a coastline that we know is changing. So it's not like 10 years from now, you'll just build on the edge. I mean, so I think a lot of the coasts we have to really give back to wildland. And I hope that that's what we do with a number of our areas. And I think some of our coastal cities are gonna figure this out and they're gonna figure out how to thrive. I can flush out a little more detail on that from what I hear from futurists and scientists that I talk to, but it's basically, um, I mean, Brenda's exactly right. I mean, um, uh, places that have wealth, which means a tax base to invest in protecting themselves will, and uh, other places won't be able to do that. And those two kinds of places will head in different directions. So, you know, you see New York City, uh, in, you know, talking of investing what's now priced at $119 billion or something like that for a seawall. And you can imagine other major cities beginning to do that. Um, 12 is the nation's 25 largest cities are, are on the coast. Um, some 80 million people will be, you know, uh, um, you know, affected by uh, the changes in those in those cities. Um, for poorer communities, uh, it's, a, it's the start of a downward spiral, uh, as economists describe it to me. So you get some the projected migration away from coastlines is, uh, you know, on the order of 14 to 20 million people. Um, I, it could be much larger than that, but that's a study uh, that came out of Florida State University that it's been influential in my work. Um, as people leave communities, those communities lose their tax base, uh, the, you know, their schools lose population, their schools lose funding, so more families leave, the lower the tax base gets, the, you know, the poorer the roads get, the more people leave because they don't like the roads and so forth, and you get this sort of downward spiral until you have um, you know, the collapse of a lot of places or uh, the people that remain there because they can't afford to move, as, as we've talked about. So you get this just really strong division um, between places that will thrive and protect themselves. Um, Charleston, another example, passed a tax measure to invest $200 million in a seawall. Um, impoverished coastal Georgia is not going to do that. Uh, and maybe that'll go back to nature or maybe the poverty in those places will, will simply deepen. Um, so, so you're going to see an urbanization and a concentration of populations in the places that can afford to protect people. And, and I just think like, um, again, like we need just to uh, change our relationship with the coast. Um, you know, I am from Puerto Rico. My family is in an island. Um, and we see the contradictions of wealthy people still building in the coast. And even though erosion and the water keeps getting closer, but I'm also seeing Puerto Ricans organizing to letting those structures just be taken by the water. Um, I think that we, we are okay into bringing back to nature watersheds and the coast where nature can protect us. Um, and then we just need to figure out how do we manage ourselves for these imbalances of those that can protect themselves and those that need our priority and our focus now so they can be also protected in the future. Well, let me move to one more question that is hopefully slightly less depressing than the answers we just heard. Uh, although Elaine, you've uh, shifted us towards a slightly more uplifting uh, direction. Uh, 
a few of you have touched on this, but there was an audience question uh, that was hoping that you could expand. What are some successful grassroots organizing efforts that uh, have made a difference on a local level and that we can look to to uh, mimic and implement in other localities? Well, uh, you know, even though like these are not maybe directly related to officially climate change, but disaster recovery and, you know, responding to to COVID, um, like Abraham said, like we need to maybe start seeing these pieces as part of this bigger strategy. Um, after Hurricane Harvey, I think our community really learned what works and what doesn't. And, um, you know, we, we hold a lot of collective knowledge and the reality is that a lot of the gaps were left to be filled by the philanthropic and nonprofit community and even grassroots organizations. Um, to give you an example, um, the philanthropic and nonprofit effort to repair homes after Harvey uh, was able to repair four times more homes than the government response. Um, so that gives you an idea of how broken this you know, disaster recovery system is. Um, but then when COVID happened, we knew that a lot of millions were going to get into our community and that we really needed to get our act together to make sure that those funds got to the people that needed the most. Um, so our community showed up and we advocated for a joint city and county strategy. No more, you know, siloed programming. Um, and that was an effort of private nonprofit, um, grassroots organizations were doing drive through events, helping people apply for assistance. Um, you had um, community organizing knock, knock around doors um, and doing peer-to-peer -peer texting campaigns to for people to know like what alternatives and choices they had while the government was making sure that those federal dollars get to our community. Um, so right now in the you know risk of climate change, I think that we need to make sure that Justice 40, you know, Let's hold accountable um, the federal government so Justice 40 um, is is held accountable. Like, uh, let's make sure that the infrastructure bill works for the worst case scenarios and hardest hit communities. Um, let's push harder and not let that housing is not considered infrastructure as part of the infrastructure bill when we know it needs to be. Um, so, really, like, how do we elevate and and use our local and grassroots networks to use the resources we have when we have them to, to move the needle and create step changes into the right direction. I can talk about two um, small successes in Washington state. Uh, both are tribal um, and I'm not Native American, but the Quinault tribe was able to move an entire city away from the coastline and, and up the hill at a town um, and they, they uh, moved the school, they moved the people, they moved everything successfully. And we've also started um, paying reparations to some of the Native American tribes in the, the United States. We're doing that for the Duwamish tribe in the form of rent for some of the, the lands that we took from them. And so I think, and I think these, while they're small and maybe only in some ways directly relate to the larger problem of how do you, how do you move really large cities, they're places where we can look at successes and we can look at things that have increased equity rather than decreased equity, which is a, gonna be a really difficult hole as we go through these changes. My mind comes quickly to just a few bureaucratic fixes in the way that FEMA and other government agencies do things that can really go a long way for those affected by climate change and related natural disasters. The example of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico comes to mind um, in the rebuilding process, how FEMA eventually accepted affidavits uh, for folks to prove where they lived uh, to uh, receive money to rebuild instead of titles. A lot of folks in Puerto Rico were missing those titles. So sort of being mindful of, of how policies aren't, aren't crafted for everyone um, initially and, and, and making that change to account for um, you know, those, those in underserved communities um, and without a lot of resources. So I think movement there, um, while small and bureaucratic can go a long way to, to helping people as well. I look at that as a success. Yeah, I want to add that during COVID, there's now a best practice to allow um, public benefits to be proof of income instead of, you know, 
adding more documentation into application processes. So really reducing, you know, administrative barriers, bureaucracy um, to get to the people when they need it the most. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest thing we can do. Absolutely. And coming back to the question of grassroots organizers, it's often those grassroots groups who are pushing for those bureaucratic fixes because they're the ones who see the where the policy is not matching up to what the realities are on the ground. Well, with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for a really fantastic discussion and to thank the audience for tuning in. Uh, the video of this panel will be up on New America's website within the next day or so. Uh, again, we thank you so much and enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>